Welcome to the Mighty Dragon. Today's guest, Rudy Reyes, is an accomplished soldier, actor, martial artist and conservationist. He came into SAS Who Dares Wins as lead instructor last year and we obviously speak about the show, audience expectations, contestant expectations and limitations. Rudy talks extensively about his life from childhood to soldier, actor and beyond. We discuss the pranks behind the scenes, his friendship with Billy and Foxy, filming in Vietnam and much more. After we spoke, I reflected on Rudy's achievements so far and it paid me to hear about his childhood. But he can be so proud that he provided the foundations for his brothers and guiding light for their well-being. What an incredible man he is. I want to dedicate this podcast to the memory of my granddad, a World War II hero who would be rather chuffed that I interviewed Rudy. Hello, Rudy. Hello. Uh, Welcome to the Mighty Dragon. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Wonderful. I am absolutely thrilled that you're on my podcast. SAS Who Dares Wins is one of the favourite shows ever in our house here. So I'm absolutely thrilled that you're on today. Thank you so much. And I absolutely love the show. I love the boys. And I love the the impact it makes for the betterment of everybody involved, not just the recruits uh, and not just uh, the directing staff, but the people that watch it too, because they can connect to and reflect upon their own lives through the journey of these recruits. It's nothing short of magnificent. I have wanted to go back with my first question, back to your childhood. And I've heard and read so much about how you brought your brothers up and it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. Um, Could you tell me how these experiences shaped the person that you are today? Yes. um, Being the oldest brother, I think there's a lot to being the oldest brother. Yeah. Um, you know, I took on the responsibilities in lieu of having any stability in the home. Uh, we didn't, my mother divorced my, my dad, Rudy Reyes Sr., when I was three. Um, and little Michael, my youngest brother, there's three of us, he had just been born. And, uh, uh, you know, something about also that I was, we we're so close in age, we're only about a year and a few months apart. So the, uh, uh, you know, I was not far off of being a toddler when I had two little brothers. I remember even at two and a half years old, three, trying to help um, my my brother Caesar uh, uh, to to put on his diapers. And we had cloth diapers back then. And I remember how <laughs> challenging it was for the for the safety pin. But I was always trying. And I think seeing these beautiful little baby boys it just inspired this very nurturing um, part of my personality and part of my soul. So I've always been a nurturing person. And some of those are traits. My mother is, is very, uh, is really emotional. Yeah. Uh, she's very empathetic. And I think I, I got that from my mother. And then my biological father, who was very, very uh, strong and um uh, always pursued competition and danger a little bit. Like he rode horses and he was a boxer and he was a Marine as well. Both my fathers wow. were Marines. So I had this balance of, um, of adventure and, yeah. uh, and, and pursuing things that are challenging. And like, I was the first kid to jump off the, the high dive uh, in yeah. the swimming pool. <laughs> And then there's the other part is that I care for my little brothers. And I, I think also as we got a little older and life became very difficult on me and I was becoming aware and conscious of, of the struggles of living in poverty, the struggles of, of, of not having um, nice clothes and not having a lot of food and living in really rough areas of the city. I noticed that we were not keeping up with um with what i envisioned to be a healthy and happy environment to raise a family so it was hard on me i was having to grow up very early and uh, that also made me want to protect and empower my brothers even more so yeah. um that that parental feeling and that that instinct uh it started with me very early and um and i still have it to this day as you notice how i i uh leave myself available and put forward positive messaging and leave myself there to get involved with veterans and their families who are struggling through veteran transition. In a sense, these are my, this is my family now. And, um, and it, 
again, it, it made me grow up very, very fast. And then for that reason, I also have a little bit of arrested development. Uh, I still collect my action figures. I have toys and comic books. And there's parts of me that forever will be that 11, 12 year old boy that wants to, to be a hero and to make a difference and fight for what's right and be brave. And no matter what the opposition stand for what's right and against all odds, I will persevere and I will win. Um, there's a part of me that will forever be that 11 year old boy. Because at that time, when I was 11, it was the very hardest for my brothers and I. Uh, we had been split up many times. We'd, I'd already been to many different schools, many different cities. And, um, and we were very sick. And uh, it's, it's interesting when I reflect back, uh, I, did not, I did not ever cry for myself. But I instead became emboldened to protect Michael and Caesar even more. And I became even more resourceful as well. Um, and w when we were finally taken to the Omaha home for boys, having medicine and having a haircut and having some nice clothes to wear to church and, uh, and working to make the boys home function and then being given an opportunity to do sport and have food in my belly and lift weights we just bloomed. I specifically bloomed when I went to the Omaha Home for Boys. Was, would you say that there was ever any competition between you and your brothers, or was it not like that for you at all uh, in your You family? know, it's so, so wild, Victoria. What's so wild is only reflecting back, do I see how close in age we were? Yeah. I felt that I was so many years older right. and that I, um, that I was at a, as a father figure. Um, we did not compete. Instead, I and I was a bit bigger and stronger. And uh, I just was fell into that paternal protector and an empowering kind of being for my little brothers. But eventually, Caesar, the, my middle brother, when we both were in our mid teens, there was some competition. And my I did my best. But my two brothers had a very, very uh, tumultuous life, just as myself. And without them being the older brother where they have to take charge and they have to lead, yeah. uh, they struggled. Uh, they struggled too. And they struggled with, with um, education. It was hard. Looking back, it's amazing that any of us could pay attention in school in any way because it was so hard. When you have no mother or father, when you've been physically abused, mentally and emotionally abused, I was sexually abused too. And there's nobody there to protect children. This is what happens to them when they fall through the cracks. And so Caesar rebelled and became more of a fighter and um, not a bully, but absolutely a rebel. Yeah. And then my youngest brother just shadowed me with everything. When, um, when I became 18 years old, I took both my brothers to live with me out of the boys' home. And Caesar had had a lot of t hard times with discipline and um, and controlling his temper and things like that. These are common things that happen to boys um, when they don't have a structure and when they don't have any love. I did my best. I got them when I got them out of the boys' home and I brought them to Kansas City with me. The gangs were so bad they could could not finish their school. So so we got them into a G, GED program and I utilized my resources. I went to the YMCA. And got us a membership so that we could lift weights together and train together. I got them jobs with me at the restaurant. We all worked very, very hard to provide for ourselves. We worked washing dishes, bussing tables. And then we started doing construction work. And I kept those brothers off the streets and into martial art. And, uh, and I did my very best to love them and to empower them. Um, but it seems that after I went away into the Marine Corps and, um, and I pursued this, this journey, you know, this hero's journey that's filled with trials and tribulations. And, and you know, heroes, heroes um, what's profound about them is that they are injured and wounded. And it's after these emotional, spiritual and physical wounds and injuries. And, and uh, when they lose sight of how to come home, it's through that journey when they come full circle. And yeah. it took me a long time to get there. And now my brothers have had struggles. Um, my brother Caesar had struggled uh, with alcoholism and he was in prison for some time. Um, and Michael 
uh, I broke my youngest brother's heart by becoming this, you know, this destroyer because I came back different. Uh, ultimately, after my third tour in, in Fallujah and Ramadi, I was hard and I was I was yeah. cold and I was dangerous, and it broke his heart. He he said, "You're not my brother anymore." And I understand now, looking back uh, yeah. through these years forward, though we have come back together as a family, and I'm just blessed and so thankful and praise God that I got him in my life and we spent a lot of time together every chance we can. Oh, that's so lovely. Very touching story. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. I want to talk about the UK version of SAS Who Dares Wins, and it was yes. shot in Vietnam. And I was wondering while it was uh, we were watching it as an American soldier, what did this mean to you? Oh, it meant so much to me. It felt like it was my real homecoming. I was born in Vietnam. Both my fathers were Marines in Vietnam. And because yeah. of the aftermath and the, the fallout of immense combat and young men carrying a rifle to protect, uh, to do their, um, to do what their country asked them to do, um, there, there's a price for that. You know, service is so why we respected it in the older generation so much, why service meant so, so much is that the older generation uh, recognized what a sacrifice it was. You know, your people in the UK in World War II, everyone sacrificed, man, woman, and child. And why service means so much is for that sacrifice. Well, it seems in the last, you know, 30 or 40 years, uh, and especially after Vietnam, we've tried to distance ourselves and move on and kind of forget. And uh, and so our Vietnam veterans, they fell through the cracks, too. And yes. my father, Rudy Reyes Sr., drank a lot and had a, extreme PTSD. So he was a policeman and he was really violent and he loved to fight. And he had to get almost to exercise this demon from him. Um, and I love him so much. But but he was. If he was not out there hunting and taking something down, if he was not out there fighting somebody else, he was fighting himself. Right. My biological father, after a second tour in Vietnam, and he came from a really well-to-do family, really well-educated, uh, he developed a heroin addiction. And I understand he never worked a day in his life after he came back and was hidden away in our fam one of our family's homes. Yeah. And um, and died a slow death. And ultimately when I was fighting in Afghanistan in 01 and 02, uh, he had passed. And so when I went looking for him years later, after I did generation kill, I thought, you know, I'm going to find my family. I've made something of myself. I'm going to show them what they missed out on, but he had already passed. Um, it's very interesting, the journey of life. Uh, I didn't let it stop me. I kept going and there were many more trials ahead and uh, I would later face extreme depression and um, and listlessness and and then uh, fell into drugs and alcohol really, really hard. And this is after I'd gone into the Hollywood machine. Right. Uh, very empty, very vacuous. It's a very vacuous place. And nobody here. I'd been fighting my guts out for this country in Afghanistan and Iraq. And everybody out here just seemed to go on you know, shopping and, and, uh, and not even recognizing that even as, as I was into the entertainment business, we were still fighting in both, in both, um, countries. Shortly after that, ISIS took over Iraq and I'd lost so many of my brothers. I'd lost, I'd lost my heart and soul out there fighting in Iraq. I'd, I'd lost my innocence in Iraq and nobody cared. And now we're just giving it over to these extremists. I started to feel that that my life meant very little and that my sacrifice and service meant very little and that my brothers and my family and my loved ones that now have this very difficult and um, battle scarred and emotionally dangerous man that's left over. I wasn't the Rudy Reyes they knew before. I was a, a recon Marine and a scout sniper and a team leader, and I was attacking everything in my life. And if there was nothing to fight, I was fighting myself. Yeah. Um, it was very challenging. Very challenging. When you arrived on the show itself, did you feel that you had to prove yourself to the audience in any way? First and foremost, the call I got from SAS, uh, it's the greatest 
professional thing I've done since the Marine Corps. Uh, this has been such a magnificent opportunity and platform. And when I got to go do the recce's with uh, Billy and Foxy, and I got to bond with those brothers so yeah. tight, uh, I absolutely felt I had to prove. I had to prove to them that I deserve to be there because these men, first of all, magnificent special operations commandos, and they built this show. I want to show respect to the UK audience and the UK people and my two brothers, Billy and Foxy, uh, for grace, uh, giving me the grace to come on to something yeah. that's so established and that the people love so much. Yeah. And so I put my best foot forward. I put my best foot forward and I still do every day. I take every day as an opportun opportunity to do my very best. When contestants join the show, do you think they underestimate the challenges both physically and mentally? I think I observe there's nothing that can prepare you in civilian world for the uh, intensity, the uh, pace, the operational tempo of being on course. Yeah. Also, these civilians did not have the benefit, like myself, Billy, Foxy, and Remy, to go through boot camp and go through indoctrination and spend months in the beginning of our careers as a nothing, as a zero, okay. and have to earn every little thing that you get. And then uh, and then competing against each other as your career develops to then go do more dangerous things. That's one thing when you think about our lineup, imagine this, your audience out there, the DS, every one of us competed, meaning pushed our minds and our bodies harder to go do more dangerous things, not to have more money or to, or to have it easier. Yeah. We chose to push ourselves harder to do more difficult things. That kind of uh, character and that, I don't know, it's a passion. It's the passion that cannot be contained in one single body. It is so, something that's so otherworldly. It's, it's a touch into heaven that just continues to, to inspire you to reach for. And, and, and these civilians, no matter how physically strong they are and how mentally amazing they are and how special they are as people, they've never had that opportunity. And this course, as, they, as Who Dares Wins, gives them that opportunity. And that's why it's so magical. I'm in my 50s myself, and I was really hoping that some of the older contestants, we just watched the US version. Uh, oh, did you like uh, it? Yeah. Did you oh, like the US version? I was totally into it. I loved it so much. And it was Excellent. in Jordan, wasn't it? I, it I, sure was. Yeah. Um, and there were some of the older contestants, and I was hoping that they would get to the end and they dropped yeah. out. Do you really think age is a factor in being able to complete it? Well, Victoria, age is. Uh, age is um, it's coming for all of us. And, and I myself, I am proud that I've made it this far. And I have, I have had this freaking combat chassis of mine strong enough to keep bleeding from the front. But yeah. uh, age is absolutely a factor. Uh, I look nice. back and I, I'm here in my office here. My lovely wife is here and I see some of my trophies and, and my photos from the Marine Corps. and and. Uh, and to be able at any time to run a marathon, I could run, I, I would, we would run marathons on the weekends and then, and then during the week be in the bush or, or swimming to an island to train and, and uh, eating, <laughs> eating freaking MRE and, and, and sweating and, 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 uh, and rain coming in or the heat of the desert living in a spider hole. And then on the weekend, still train harder or go to a symposium to, to practice our swimming with the Olympians. Uh, right. When you're young, your body can do this. Your body recovers. Uh, I, when I went through my SEER, my survival evasion and resistance escape, the, um, the POW training, um, I was eating grasshoppers and moss for a week before I was finally captured. And then I was beaten and tortured. And unlike the show, they beat you and they, they torture you and they, they waterboard you and they work you physically very, very hard on top of the mental stuff. That uh, after I graduate, uh, I lost only about seven or eight pounds, only seven or eight pounds. And then the next day I went right to the gym. This is what you can do when you're young. When you're yeah. older, the, um, 
uh, you've written a lot of checks on your body and yeah. then sometimes they're going to get cashed. However, <laughs> as we know, as we're getting in this new modern world of health and wellness, we can delay that process and we can hold back the hands of time by uh, regular physical training, uh, diet, sleep, and, um, and stress mitigation. I think yeah. that's my secret. Yeah, I was trying to work out what challenges I could potentially do, and none of them. <laughs> I uh, you know, <laughs> you, you well, all that would matter is that you try. But uh, uh, like yeah. back to uh, the the American Special Forces, uh, world's toughest test, who I absolutely adored and gave us such incredible effort was Kenya Moore, and she was fifty one. Oh yeah, she made it yes. quite close to the end. Her knee started going bad early on, but yeah. she approached every task with passion and uh, was a go-to recruit. She hustled with everything she did, and her spirit was amazing. Yeah. In time, the body, uh, when you are in your 40s and 50s, 60s, you can only do so much when the standard is military special operations. That is why young men do it. You mentioned your martial arts background, your instructor. Yes. Do you feel this discipline provided you with the mental resilience when you were in service? Absolutely. I still train my martial arts to this day, and I train my martial art in service on my downtime. I had very little downtime in the School of Infantry. And on the weekends, when the young Marines would go into town to drink beer, I went to the main side swimming pool and trained my swimming and did martial art. On my downtime, I always worked my martial art. It was um, a mental and emotional, spiritual checklist for me to come back to center and quiet the noise and really be present. And yeah. on operations, that is so critical. You know, when the, when the lead is flying in and out and uh, the rockets and the, the aircraft are zooming above you and targets, an enemy are being engaged and they're firing machine guns at you and you're moving your men and you're getting into the fight. If you do not have that presence of mind and return to that calmness, it is pure chaos and it will cripple you. It will, it will crush you. You must instead center yourself, expand your consciousness with your uh, your left and right lateral limits, because what happens under combat stress, you get tunnel vision like this, like in life, right? Like right. when you get a stress, stress in life, when it's really overwhelming, you just go like this. Yeah. The warrior will seek to expand that. And then when you can do that, you can do anything. Watching the show and seeing the people who make it to the end of the show, I, for me, the main themes are being resilient, adaptable, and also the ability to evolve. Would you say this is correct? Yes. Yes. These, the, the recruits and, and I've stayed uh, close to them on social media and such. Um, I, we're very close. It's a bond that you'll never forget. Just like my instructors and I, and my recon brother team teammates, we have a bond that we will never, we will never lose. There's something that very few can understand what I see across the board. Like look at the little Maisie and, um, and, uh, fern, holy smoke! She would have never known those yeah. uh, th those small women yes. could go all the way. And then my the the first uh, the first one I did um, with shy and the um, the sh short girl with her pretty eyes. We would have never imagined that they would have made it to the end, considering we had yeah. such strong men on the course. What yeah. what is interesting is that these. Women were, first of all, very physically strong and very physically fit. Uh, Fern McCann, not the not much, but she had an indomitable spirit. Right. The other women had um, spirit, physical fitness. Um, their bones and joints were down, and we do not discriminate, as you know. The, the it was just nothing short of remarkable because I have never ever believed that women had a space or a place in special operations, much less the infantry. I just never thought it was possible. I didn't think they have what it takes. I didn't think their bodies had what it takes, but I was proven wrong. So I think there are some women out there that of course have the mental and emotional strength, but have the athletic strength 
to yes. uh, if the standards are held the same to be uh, an asset to us in special operations. It really blew my mind. I'm very proud, very proud yeah. to say that. I, w- I was honestly, it was just an amazing ending for those ladies. Um, I was so Wow, you know, as a woman, I was just so proud to see them. There. <laughs> me too. Absolutely. Me too. I was blown away. I was blown away. Yeah. And and then, and and it, and it shook out the same way on special forces. We had yeah. Carly Lloyd, who is a legend footballer, as you guys would say, yeah. legend footballer. Baller. And then we had a um, a beauty pageant yeah. and a reality TV star Hannah Brown. Again, that smile of hers. It uh, it was not show. She brought an attitude of optimism to every task she did. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of her. Very proud of her. I also got to throw a shout out to Colm, uh, Colm Best. Uh, man, you know what? Second day in, he, he was completely green. I think he was detoxing from, from drinking, from everything. He was green. He was moving so slow. I swear his eyes were moving in different directions. I thought for sure he was going to be done in a couple of days. He found himself there. He found himself there and he continued going forward. Same with Mr. Ashley McCain. I know he got hurt in the end and he didn't make it, but these men found themselves there and it was yeah. really beautiful to watch. We've touched upon mental health of um, soldiers. And as you stated before, it was very much overlooked in post-war Britain. When they returned from World War II, they just had to go back, if they returned back to their That's families true. and their jobs. Was this the same in the US? And how is this handled now, especially for those with PTSD? Yes. The warrior's homecoming has always been a challenge for every society from the dawn of man. But prior to the Industrial Revolution, um, our soldier citizens, um, their families and their whole nations behind them were a part of the service. They were intimately connected. Now we have professional uh, militaries and we are all, um, we all sign the contract and and, uh, we volunteer. So there's almost a bit of a disconnect in that already. Um, The whole nation, the the, the mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters of the entire nation uh, are not praying for their soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen overseas. Only some families are doing that and with that disconnect it is uh, that disconnect becomes bigger and bigger and bigger especially as the years go on in the wars we were in global war on terror for 20 years and when our men and women come back our society has no idea who they are and we ourselves don't know how to reintegrate um, at least in the industrial revolution and after world war ii what america and what the uk did is that we had this massive Um, uh, industry and then soon technology uh, business exploding and our men went back to work and by working they helped work out some of the PTSD and what we found though is on uh, these men that fought in World War II when they retired the alcoholism the spousal abuse and the suicide because it wasn't dealt with. We weren't talking about it. And then we were right into the Cold War. And then we were into the, into the Vietnam War, my country. And then war became a dirty word. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, it's interesting. War is, um, it is the one thing that we can count on in the human experience. Why? Because we do not know how yet to work things out diplomatically and to share between tribes cultures and nations because in our dna we contest yeah. there's something about us that contest and some of that is good i'll tell you what's good about it if we don't compete as people um and mediocrity becomes the normal um then uh then i don't think the human race would make it we'd physically be weak mentally be weak we would not be uh in gene uh, uh in uh, use uh, ingenuity to evolve to change. We would not know how to uh, create better communications and such. But the downside is that because we compete and fight, if we do not have a tempered soul with character and morals, we can easily become tyrants. And um, I mean, um, my Russian people, I love my Russian people, but they're 
their uh, government are tyrants. The Chinese people, I did Chinese Kung Fu and trained with China's national team, trained in China. And I love my Chinese culture, but their government is totalitarian and, and yeah. they uh, ty- uh, tyrannical. Same with North Korea. Um, and uh, that's that's the other side of human competition and war. So we must find a way to be warriors without becoming tyrants. When comparing the British SAS and their American counterparts, is the training very similar or is it very different? I would I think uh, what I observe our training is identical. We have a we have a uh, sh- uh, uh, a share program, what do you call it? A ambassador program. We send oh, our right. recon brothers, our mountain leaders, and our scout snipers to England. England sends theirs. Uh, the UK sends theirs to us. We've been working together. We're a, a band of brothers, and we have a, a bond across the pond that's so strong for so many years, um, yeah. so many decades, so uh, hundreds of years. Think of it. We are the outgrowth of the UK. America is uh, the UK 2.0. You know, with um. We really are. We we got our idea of rule of law. We got our idea of human rights. We, we this is all originally from our our uh, European uh, fighting days, and then yeah. into the UK, and then into democracy. Uh, it's it's what the only thing that's different is the accents. And <laughs> you find by working with Foxy and Billy, and and <laughs> holy smokes, the sense of humor is the same. That this. The experience of fighting and fighting together is the same. The only thing different is the accents. Now, the UK's military is much smaller. So I would say they're even more surgical when it comes to um, the intellectual and the uh, emotional aspects needed to be in special operations. I think America tends to focus harder initially on the physical, but all roads lead to Rome. Yeah. When you put yourself into an extreme discipline, when you are, when you are um, tested against the very best continually, uh, the combination of character, physical strength, emotional strength, and passion, it all rises to the top. That's one thing you'll see about Billy. Foxy, myself, and Chris. I love my man, Chris the Hammer. Oh, we yeah. have a passion. We have a passion to do our best and to be with each other. And we all communicate. We have little rules, like one singer, one song. Whoever's leading the task, one singer, one song. We sing the same song as that leader. We do rehearsals, rehearsals, rehearsals. We make sure we look sharp. We look at each other's uniforms before we step uh, out of the barracks, out of the accommodations to make sure we're looking good. Make sure we have all of our freaking equipment that is necessary. Um, the brilliance in the basics is the same in the UK and in America. Yeah, I must admit, in the US version of the show, there seems to be a lot less swearing. <laughs> than yeah, they don't the let us swear. <laughs> they don't let us use the F word. They don't uh, yeah. let us use the C word <laughs> because it's um, it's like national television. And, yes. <laughs> uh, and you know, you know, it's so interesting. Of course, the boys and I, we can curse crazy, but. You know what? I don't know if if this is happening in the UK. I'm noticing in America, children, uh, and I consider teenagers children as well. It becoming um, it becoming acceptable for them to curse around adults. Oh yeah, and that is not the way I grew up, and I do yeah. not like what is happening. I think um, because we love to contest, cursing and making jokes. And saying bad words is actually sharpening wit because Billy's the best at it. Billy is the best. <laughs> One liners, he's the best cursor, he's the best storyteller, he's the best. It's sharpening wit. But when we have children not understanding context and um, saying bad words, I think um, it, well, I think it, it, we will lose respect. And I, I see it happening in my country. I don't know if it's happening in your country or yeah. elderly. Or, our elderly are not respected. Our adults are not respected. Our our teachers um, are not respected. And we have to turn that around. And Absolutely. I'm doing my best to do that. Yeah, I totally agree. Working alongside Foxy and Billy, there must have been some fun behind the scenes moments. Can you share any? Oh, so many. <laughs> so many. So, yeah, yeah like, uh, you know, Billy went to go check my pillow um, because my hair is, I'm Mexican, American, right? So I have dark yeah. hair. 
and uh, and then I put and I, and and on the and I used to have that really long hair. I love yeah. the long hair, but the 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 American um, special forces says, Rudy, we want you to look more military. I'm like, okay, but however, I looked crazy like that when I was fighting overseas too, because we blend, hide, and deceive. Uh, I would, uh-huh. um, yeah, I would disguise myself as uh, as somebody that worked on base that was either Turkish or Pakistani, or I would dress as a contractor. Uh, so that I could um, uh, be bait for insurgents to come try to kidnap me. And then we would turn the tables on them and kill them. Um, so, uh, but for the American audience, they wanted to be a little bit more proper, right? So <laughs> Billy, Billy, but when my hair was long, I always used a little of this Moroccan hair oil on my beard and on my hair. <laughs> and so it was really nice and black. But he's like, mate, I, I thought yeah, I would see some hair dye on your pillow. <laughs> I hate you even more. Now oh, no. You have your hair. You hardly have any gray. I mean, yeah. it's just so much. And then, and then, uh, of course, I have a really fast metabolism. And so I eat at night. I, it, and I can't help it. But at <laughs> two in the morning, every morning, maybe three, you know, they'll hear me, you know, tiptoeing over to the, uh, to the refrigerator and then they'll hear me getting into the crisps. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and oh, the, and the, yeah there's, we got, uh, Foxy and I have a running chili sauce game because, yeah. uh, I had to go do a recce for a task because it got flooded in Vietnam. We had to shift the task. I had to go run, do a recce in the middle of the day while they were running another task. And I didn't know how long I'd be gone. So I brought a little bit of chow with me so I could eat in the mountains if I had to. And I brought the chili sauce. And, and so I brought the chili sauce, right? We had some other chili sauces there, but we all liked the chili sauce. And um, and I guess the other two chili sauces were empty. So I get back from the recce. We do some more work. We're running the course. and um, And now we got our dinner chow, our evening chow. And, uh, and we're starting to eat and, and there's no chili sauce. And, and Foxy's like, man, there's, we're out of chili sauce. He's talking to the freaking producers. Hey, we need some more chili sauce. I said, oh, hold on. Let me go check my bag. And I brought my chili sauce out of my bag. He's like, you, you son of a bitch. You're hoarding the chili <laughs> sauce. You know, you freaking, oh, you know, Semper I, instead of Semper Fi, you're hoarding the chili sauce. So then I started finding chili sauce bottles in my boots. I started finding <laughs> chili sauce bottles at- and then Chris jumped on the bandwagon. Bill, Chris and, and Foxy jumped on the bandwagon. They were always asking, where's the chili sauce at? And then I'd find them in my boots. So we're always messing around. It's so awesome. Yeah. It's just like being back in the unit. Looking back at your career so far, what's been your standout moment? Oh, boy. You know, I've had so many. I've had so many. Um, I went undefeated in eighth grade in the Omaha Home for Boys in Nebraska as a wrestler. And, I was the only kid in the whole boys' home that made it, and I was really proud. Uh, I then became a kickboxer and did martial arts and won many gold medals and and fought China's best and Russia's best. Then I joined the Marine Corps. I became a recon Marine and and a scout sniper and fought through many wars. My team leader was shot right next to me, and I had to take over the team right there in the middle of a gun battle and somehow survive and come back yeah. to Fallujah and Ramadi and lead a team, I'm a seasoned team leader, and I fight for what I believe is right. Uh, then I get into film and television, and now I am put on a pedestal for the world to see, to represent my nation, yeah. represent my unit. I take that very seriously. But then when I started Force Blue, rebuilding coral reefs, doing ocean conservation with other commandos like myself, I had a Royal Marine Commando, John Schlayer, I've got SEALs, I've got pararescuemen, Green Berets, recall Marines. Foxy is going to be joining the team soon too. We use our military diving skills to rebuild coral reefs. And now I'm utilizing my warrior background and skills that I had uh, hard learned and hard fought in the U.S. military to now rebuild and create and protect. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You know what? And there's more to come. I mean, I've got more TV stuff and more film stuff coming too. I've got another book that I'm working on. I'm working on my own biography. So so there's more to come. I, I'm not done yet. That sounds good. One last question. Your Instagram account reflects your very busy, motivational um, life. Do you have any downtime? And what do you do? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. My downtime, I've had a few weeks now with my wife, and it's fantastic. And of course, when we're da- our downtime is with the animals, and then we're training hard. 
We're yeah. training hard. And, and my beautiful missus is a firearms instructor and competitor. So she's training all the time at the range. And now it's so wonderful. She trains me. I am her student, like my, my yeah. other veteran brothers, we get together, she runs the course, and then we do our weapons uh, work with her. She's so fantastic. And we're working on our physical fitness because we always have another mission coming. However, we get to hug and cuddle every night. Uh, oh. And the, the cat <laughs> sleeps in this arm when the dog sleeps at the foot <laughs> of the bed. Um, yeah. uh, we really embrace the time that we have with each other because we know that our work and our passions for um, our profession take us far away. So when we come home, she's number one. That's what I do with my, my downtime. I make sure that my wife and my children and my family is number one. And I just carve out my time to do some training and keep myself mentally, physically, and spiritually prepared for the next thing. That's wonderful. I'd like to thank you for coming on to the podcast and all the best to you, your wife and your lovely family and all the best for SAS Who Dares Wins. Thank you so much for having me on and you all have thank the you. very best day out there. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rudy. Bye. Bye bye. That was bye -bye. awesome. It was awesome.